Hey guys, good evening and welcome to the Ironman 70.3 Memphis course info, tips and tricks, and Q&A. Thanks for everyone who submitted questions uh, over the last week or so. Um, I'm gonna get to as many of those as possible, either in the presentation here in the next few minutes or uh, at the very end, I'm gonna get in as many questions as we have time for. Uh, if you have a question now, Again, there's a chance I may answer it uh, during the presentation, but uh, go ahead and use that GoToWebinar widget uh, on your screen, uh, submit your question there, and I will either answer your question at the end during the presentation, or if we run out of time, I will respond to you follow up in the next couple of days prior to the race via email. So I'll get you an answer to your question. My name is John Mayfield. I am a full-time triathlon coach. I am USA Triathlon Level 2 and Ironman U certified, and I've had the privilege of coaching hundreds of athletes from first-timers to professionals and everyone in between. I work exclusively with long course athletes, so those racing the 70.3 and Ironman distance triathlons. I am passionate about uh, long course racing, uh, both uh, from, from my own racing and uh, working with athletes that I, that I coach. So what I wanna do here this evening is share some of my experience as, uh, and my education as a coach to help increase your confidence and reduce your stress as you head into your race day so that one, you can produce your best possible performance and two, you can enjoy this experience for, for all that it is. Uh, racing long course is, is a very special thing. Uh, it's very enjoyable. You make amazing memories, um, and, and I want you to, to get the best from that. So again, that, that is my intent here this evening is, again, to help you produce your best race results and enjoy uh, this race in Memphis as, as best you can. So I'm going to be uh, sharing some information about the course uh, as, as along with some tips. So before we even get started here, uh, tips before race day. Now, this is something I'm going to keep coming back to over and over here uh, this evening. First tip is to stay hydrated. Uh, it is absolutely critical that you stay hydrated throughout the race. And that really begins with ensuring that you show up to the start line uh, with a, a good level of hydration. So this is going to be part of, of those last couple of days as you head into race day. So my advice is to always have a water bottle handy, um, not just water, but also water with electrolytes. So if you're taking in a whole bunch of water uh, without electrolytes, just plain water, you're going to uh, flush out uh, your electrolytes, which is going to be counterproductive. So uh, in those last couple of days, two, three days, just always have uh, a bottle of, of some sort of electrolyte uh, beverage there with you. My go-to as uh, I, I am approaching a long course triathlon uh, is, is I like the vitamin water and I'm going to uh, come back to that here in just a couple minutes. So that one will kind of come full circle. Limit time on your feet. So uh, you're going to be using your legs extensively on, on race day. So uh, we want to limit the amount of use in those days leading into the race. Now, um, it's simply because there are so many things that you can do in so much time that you can very easily spend on your, your feet and you can and kind of overdo it more so than you normally would. Most of us uh, have uh, desk jobs and, and uh, we lounge around the house. We're not spending all day on our feet, but if uh, you head down to downtown Memphis, you're walking up and down Beale Street, you're checking out the local attractions, you're going down to the race site to check in, drop your bike off, getting in those last session um, prior to, to the race, there's a lot of time spent on your feet. So just be aware of the time that you're spending on your feet, limit it as you are able to, and then pair that with adequate recovery. So whatever those recovery modalities that you have been engaging in as race day approaches, make sure that you continue those through race day. So your, your foam rolling, your, uh, static and dynamic stretches, uh, your, your, um, compression boots, um, percussion guns, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing to stay healthy, make sure that you are um, continuing those as race day approaches. Check out the course. 
So I, I always recommend putting eyes on as much of a, a race course as possible prior to race day, simply because uh, you don't want any surprises come race day. So uh, always go uh, and, and see the course. Um, here, this swim venue is, is very easy to see. There's a nice path around the whole thing. Uh, and, and our nice added bonus to that is a lot of that doubles as your run course. Um, so there is a practice swim available Friday from eight to 10. Um, you do have to have, uh, checked in prior, uh, to, to, um, participate in that practice swim. So if you want to get in on that Friday practice swim, make sure that you have checked in on Thursday, um, and, and double check to make sure to see what time check-in closes on, on Thursday. So, uh, from there, it's a great idea to go and, and see that swim course, um, and even, uh, feel exactly what you're in store for. What does the water temperature feel like? Um, and, and just again, how are the, the buoys set up all those kinds of things prior to, to race day, and then go drive the, the race course. Um, there will very likely be brightly colored tape marking, uh, the route. So it's pretty simple, uh, to, to follow. Um, there are quite a few turns out on the course. So, um, maybe have a GPX file, uh, or, or a map there, but, uh, chances are, um, it's going to be pretty easy to follow those stripes that you'll be following on race day. And again, um, I'm, I'm going to use some terms later on things like, uh, rolling hills and some undulation or, or not steep hills, but that's my definition, my opinion. Um, and, and everyone's going to have a little different interpretation of those things. So I always recommend going and seeing exactly what I'm referring to so that you can have your own context to it. You can apply, uh, your own understandings to it and not be caught off guard or surprised come race day. So, uh, same thing for the run course. Uh, it's a mix of road and path. You can get in, um, your last run or two out there on different sections of the course, uh, ride your bike along, uh, those sections as, as well. Um, so great opportunities to go and see this entire course. And again, have a, a well vetted plan, knowing exactly what you're in store for on race day. Be sure to read the athlete guide. Um, these are chock full of good, important, critical information. Um, and inevitably, uh, each race will have one or two different things. So even if you are a seasoned veteran that has done uh, a dozen or more of these Ironman 70.3 events, yes, a lot of that athlete guide is going to look exactly the same as other events that you've done. But uh, what is important um, and perhaps even critical are those one or two other things that are, are specific and unique to, to this race. And sometimes those things can be uh, uh, deal killers. So uh, make sure that you are aware of everything um, in there. And one of those things that is unique to, to this race is uh, the parking. So uh, last year between the weather and uh, the traffic getting in, uh, parking was an absolute mess. It was a disaster. Um, there were folks that were delayed, uh, for or stuck for, for hour to two hours in line trying to get into the park. So they have made some, some good enhancements to parking this year, and they are actually handing out parking passes. So those are available down there at the Ironman Expo. So make sure to grab one of those when you are down there checking in, get your parking pass. Um, and that's going to make that whole parking situation, uh, much, much better. So have a plan for that. Um, know where you're going to park, know what time you need to get down there. I would still advise erring on the side of being early. I always recommend that for pretty much everything, uh, involved in these races. Um, so travel early, get to the race early, do everything you can drive, uh, check in bike, drop off all those things, do them as early as you can. Um, and that includes arriving and parking on race day. So now uh, a couple things more so specific to, to race day optimize your tire pressure. Now, this is something that um, has been part of the conversation more and more in the last few years, uh, but still there, there are those that are, are a bit slow to, to come around. Uh, years and years ago, uh, everyone was using 100 to, to even 160, 180 PSI uh, in their tires. The thought was uh, the higher the PSI, the, the less contact the tires can have with the road, less rolling resistance, the faster you're going to be. Well, um, we've, we've since learned that that's not necessarily the case. In fact, the vast majority of athletes are overinflating their tires, which leads to a risk of, of flats and, and actually is just slower. So 
Um, what we have found is that most athletes will benefit, uh, from a tire pressure somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 pounds. Even those, um, like myself that I race around 170 pounds, my race pressure is 80 PSI. Now I do have, um, a little bit wider wheels. I've got the wider tires, um, that, that's set up for that. So, uh, a resource that I highly recommend you check out is, um, the Silka, uh, tire pressure guide, S I L C A. Uh, they make, uh, tubes and other, uh, bike accessories, and they've done a whole bunch of research. They've got a great calculator that you can plug in a couple variables and it'll tell you exactly what tire pressure you should be running for, uh, your setup. So definitely recommend checking that out. Now, uh, going to get perhaps a little, even more controversial, uh, as we go in here. Now, uh, something you may hear, something you may have always done, something, uh, that you may absolutely believe in or have been told emphatically that you need to do is to deflate your tires overnight. Um, so yes, it will be cooler overnight. It will warm, uh, uh, as the day, uh, progresses, but, um, the, so the thought is you need to deflate your tires overnight. If not, the, the change in, in temperature is going to change, uh, have a lead to a change in tire pressure, which is going to cause your tires to pop absolute myth. It's not true. And in fact, um, if your tire does pop on race day, because it didn't, uh, because it wasn't inflated, deflated overnight, it's because there was a flaw in, uh, the tire or in the tube. So you want that tire to pop overnight as opposed to during the race. So, um, don't deflate your tires. There's, uh, especially in these, these road bike tires, there's a very small mass of air in that tire. Uh, it would take much more, um, change in temperature to produce, uh, that much expansion in the air. Um, so if, if we're, we're having that much of a change in temperature, we've got bigger issues than, uh, your tire popping. So don't deflate your tire overnight. Um, just let it be aired up in the morning, but there's no need to deflate it overnight. But, uh, again, if there's something wrong with your tire, you want that thing to pop overnight, not at, uh, mile two, 10, 20, mile 50 of the course. So you'll have the opportunity to take care of that, um, in the morning. The other thing is don't cover your saddle. There's really no need to, to do that. Um, well, my saddle's going to get wet. Uh, there's going to be precipitation or, uh, humidity dew. Well, sure. But, uh, the first thing you're going to do is, uh, jump on that bike soaking wet. And the first thing to get really, really wet, uh, is that saddle. So there's just no need to, to cover your saddle, uh, or the bars for that sake. Um, the one thing you may consider that, that still isn't even really necessary. The one thing you could probably, um, do is cover your drive chain, but, um, remember oil and water don't mix. So a well lubricated, uh, drive system is going to be just fine. Uh, even in the rain is going to be fine. So, um, really those things don't really need to worry about prior to race day. All right. So on to the race, of course, starting with the swim. So at the swim start, uh, water temperature will be announced, uh, early in the morning. The official temperature will be taken, uh, several hours prior to the start of the swim. Um, so in the last two years had, uh, somewhat of a, a fluctuation in the water temperature, uh, last year, 70.9 degrees year before that 76.3 degrees. So, um, what we had last year was a water temperature that was well below, uh, the wetsuit cutoff, which is 76.1 degrees. Um, and then the year before that, uh, barely above. Uh, so I, I want to say the day before the race, it measured 76.1. And then on race day, it was 76.3. So, uh, wetsuit legal is up to including 76.1 degrees, um, at 76.2 or above, it becomes what they refer to as wetsuit optional. Um, when, if you decide to race in a wetsuit, um, if it is 76.2 or higher, uh, you will start after all of those that, uh, opt not to swim in a wetsuit and you will not be eligible for awards or world, uh, championship allocation. You'll still be an official finisher. You'll still get your medal, all that. Uh, those are just the only caveats. Should you choose to, uh, wear a wetsuit at 76.2 or higher? Race starts at 7 a.m. It is a self-seated rolling start. So what that means is you will line up um, on the, the shore there near the start according to your expected swim time. Uh, they will have signs 
uh, placed throughout the queue that have uh, five minute increments on it. So uh, the first five, first sign is 25 minutes and faster. Then you have 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and so forth, all the way back to one hour plus. So you, what you will do is uh, line up with those that are going to be swimming a similar speed to you, which is going to help reduce the contact, minimize the amount of athletes that you're swimming over and the amount of athletes that are swimming over you. It is a beach entrance and exit, uh, so a relatively shallow, uh, kind of small small lake, big pond here uh, at the park. So basically you will wade in, um, and then upon completion of the swim, you will wade back out. So a couple tips uh, for the swim start is create a wetsuit plan. So um, not really knowing what the water temperature is going to be on, on race day. There are some, uh, some, some opinions getting kicked around out there, but really, uh, in this size Lake one is volatile, uh, not real big, not real deep. So the water temperature can fluctuate, uh, weather is still quite warm, uh, there in Memphis highs are still, uh, getting into the upper eighties, low nineties over the last several days. Rain of course can impact the water temperature as well. And what we've seen is, uh, over the past two years, one year it was, uh, safely below that wetsuit cutoff. Uh, and then we had another year where it was just above. So we really don't know. Uh, we'll have a better idea as race day approaches. Um, typically they will be posting those, um, daily temperatures in the athlete village. So when you go to check in, um, generally it's posted there where you can see what, uh, that day's temperature was. Um, and you know, it, it's, it, that'll give you a pretty good idea of where it's going to be, but, uh, we won't know officially until race morning. So, um, what are you going to do for any given water temperature? So, um, a race like this, chances are you're not going to need a sleeved suit. Um, so if you are deciding between say a swim skin or, or just your, your kit, um, I would say the decision largely is between a sleeveless kit or a sleeveless, uh, wetsuit and, and a swim skin. Now, if all you have is a sleeved wetsuit, take that into consideration as, as well. So, um, something we're going to be talking about later on is maintaining our core temperature. So this is up there, uh, with hydration, nutrition, um, and staying cool. This really is going to start during the swim. What we don't want to do is overheat on the swim, which is, which is actually quite easy to do, especially if the water temperature is in that mid seventies or, or higher. Um, so this may be a consideration, even if it's, uh, 76.1, um, and, and is wetsuit legal, you may opt not to wear that wetsuit simply because that is still going to be relatively warm. And it's looking like race day, um, can be quite warm as, as well. I just looked at a 10 day forecast and it is still forecasting mid to upper eighties on race day, which is quite warm when you're going to be out there racing 70.3 miles. So, um, if you are confident, um, in, in not wearing a wetsuit, you know, where is your cutoff? Is it 76.1? Is it 74? Uh, is it somewhere in between there? So have a plan to know exactly what you're going to do for any given water temperature. What we don't want to do is make, um, make any decisions on race day that we can make. Now, there are going to be a lot of decisions you're going to have to make. It's uh, pretty easy, easy to uh, get into decision fatigue. So make those decisions now where race day becomes simple execution. Get queued early. Uh, as I mentioned before, I recommend doing everything early. So, uh, get parked, get your transition area set up and then get down to the swim queue early. So one, uh, just planning ahead is, is planning for success. And this is going to allow you to, to get down there, to get exactly where you want to be and not have to fight the crowds or rush or be stressed, anything like that. Part of that goes along with this next tip, which is don't queue slower than expected. What we see a lot of athletes do, um, is, is maybe be overly conservative or cautious, or maybe they're hanging back with a friend. I've done this and I, I will say it does, uh, lead to a, a more challenging, slower swim. Um, so, um, get there, know what you would expect. And again, these are five minute windows. So you should have a pretty good idea of which five minute window you're going to be. It doesn't have to be exact, but know which five minute window you are going to do that swim course in and then, uh, line up according to, to that. 
And then as you enter the water, um, the great thing about these, these beach, um, beach access is, uh, you can enter in at your own pace. So it's not like you're going to be diving off of a, a ferry boat or a dock or anything like that into freezing cold water. Uh, this is water's going to, uh, quite, quite, um, quite likely be, be relatively warm and you can enter into it at your own pace. So, uh, especially if you have a history of, of panic attacks or, uh, having, having issues on the swim, just settle in, splash some of that water on your face and, uh, do a sink down if you need to. And, uh, taking a, a, a few minutes or even a few seconds there at the beginning of the swim, just to settle in and get comfortable that is going to pay dividends later on when you're able to uh, swim more, spend less time, perhaps rolling over on your back, less time hanging onto a kayak, anything like that. All right. So the actual swim course is uh, a point to point course. Uh, it is largely protected, which is really nice. So this is really going to uh, reduce um, the amount of movement on top of the water. Uh, as you can see here, basically it's it's almost hard to uh, squeeze in a 1.2 mile swim into uh, into this lake. So we're not going to have any concerns of any kind of water movement, currents, tides, anything like that. Uh, this is going to probably be about as close to a swimming pool as you can get. So um, worst case, if it's a windy day, there may be a little bit of surface chop. But um, again, no swells, no waves, no, no tides or uh, anything like that. So uh, protected water. So it should be relatively calm, relatively flat. Uh, majority of the course is in a east to west direction. So again, you'll be starting over there uh, on the eastern side of the lake, swimming basically all the way to the other side of the lake and then coming back. Um, so obviously sunrise is to the east. So for the majority of the swim course, uh, that sunrise will be to your, your back. Uh, but then as you, um, make the U-turn for approximately that last third, uh, you'll be headed back pretty much into that sunrise. So take that into consideration. Um, I, I, and I would say not great water quality. It's not dirty. Um, so to speak, there's, there's not concerns with, uh, uh, necessarily the, um, health aspect of the water, but, um, it's, it's a, a relatively small, um, mud based mud bottom. Um, so it, it is going to be, uh, definitely more so on the murky side, especially once everyone gets in there, start swimming, turning it all up. Um, so you'll be able to see the buoys, you'll be able to sight, but probably not a, a ton of visibility, um, under the water. So a couple tips for the swim course, consider that sunrise when choosing your goggles. So, um, again, not a, a big factor, uh, for a lot of the race, but, uh, that last third or so, um, when you make that turn, you will definitely be swimming back into that sunrise. Uh, the other would be if you breathe predominantly over your right shoulder, uh, conceivably you could have a little bit of, of sun in your eyes when you're turning to breathe. But that said, when you're siding off those buoys looking forward, uh, going to be pretty good, but still would recommend, um, a tinted or mirrored goggle just to, uh, ensure, um, being able to, to see, uh, well, Break the course into segments. Now, this is something that I do uh, and advise for for every uh, section of the race, even the race itself. Uh, this is a great big elephant, and how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So um, don't think about racing 70.3 miles. Don't even think about swimming 1.2 miles. Break it down into sections. The, the easiest way to do that um, is uh, to approach this in sections. So we have... Um, kind of four sections. There are turn buoys set up uh, on that outward stretch where you're not really turning. It's more of a curve, as you can see. Um, there are some straightaways and then you make a, a little bit of an adjustment, a uh, relatively long stretch and then another adjustment. Then you make the U-turn. So break it down. Even swimming buoy to buoy can help um, break it down. And uh, for me, it's all about a sense of accomplishment. Um, so basically I swam to this buoy. Now I just need to swim to that next one. So breaking it down, uh, is just swimming buoy to buoy until I reach that last finish one. And then upon uh, approaching the exit, swim until your hand touches. So uh, what you're going to see is, is folks that have been out there for a uh, pretty long time and uh, they're tired of swimming. I absolutely understand that. I get that. I experience it every time I race. Um, but uh, don't stand up early. You're, you're going to be very inefficient 
uh, trying to to wade through or run through uh, chest deep, waist deep, even knee deep water. Um, so take just a few more strokes and keep swimming until your hand touches the the ground. Once you um, can no longer swim effectively, then it's time to to stand up. And that that's a good tip regardless of, of what your swim exit is like. If you're swimming to a dock, a ladder, a staircase, anything like that, just keep swimming until your hand touches. Uh, it's only going to be a few more strokes, but you're going to be much more efficient um, completing those last few yards of your swim by doing that. All right. Once you complete that swim, there is a uh, little bit of a jog uh, from that swim exit over to the transition area. Now, uh, anyone who raced last year or uh, is aware of, of last year's race, that is when uh, the rain came. Um, the transition area is in a grass field um, and it got quite muddy. So uh, hopefully that uh, was taken care of in years past. Hopefully. Um, the the forecast will continue to hold up and and you guys will have just a bluebird day uh for racing but just know that if uh it is raining on race day or in the days leading into the race um it, it can get uh, quite messy so uh, just kind of be aware of that plan for that know your location this is a, a a very large transition area there are a whole lot of racks there are a whole lot of bikes that look a whole lot alike um, so know your location. When you go down the day before to drop your bike off, pay attention to uh, landmarks and that sort of thing. Now, um, all of the rows will be labeled um, with a, a letter or a number, uh, but also look for other things. You know, is, are you near a light pole or a garbage can? Anything like that that can help make it easier for you to identify where your bike is. What we don't want to do is waste time looking for your bike, going down the wrong row, anything like that. And then once you um, arrive at your bike, be efficient. Um, limit the amount of things that you're going to do in transition. Limit the amount of movements that you need to make. By doing so, you're going to ensure that you get through transition quickly. But it's also going to reduce the risk that you forget something or, or do something wrong. Along with that is pack minimally. So um, the fewer things we have in transition, the fewer things we have to do. Again, quicker we get in and out the lower the risk of, of forgetting to do something. But this also helps us play nice with those around us. So uh, your transition area will be set up there under your bike um, on the ground. There will be lots of others set up around with you. What you don't want to do is is be that neighbor um, that, that has a whole bunch of stuff and, and is taking up more than your share of the space. Practice in advance. So chances are you've been spending anywhere from probably 10 to 15 hours a week of, of training over the last several months in preparation for this race. Um, but how much time have you spent practicing your transitions? Um, it doesn't take a whole lot, but practice makes perfect or, or that said perfect practice makes perfect. So, um, instill in yourself just a, a routine, know what you're doing, practice it so that you can move through it quickly, efficiently, and again, ensure that you're not forgetting anything. And then this is one of my favorite tips. Um, I have to give credit to my friends at Precision Fuel and Hydration. They are the ones who uh, passed this on to me. Consider a go bottle. So um, in the very beginning, I mentioned that in the days leading into the race, um, I always have a couple bottles of vitamin water. Uh, one of the reasons I like it is that I think the product is good, uh, but I also like the bottle. So the bottle has a, a large mouth on it, uh, which makes drinking from it uh, quick and easy. So a go bottle, um, I will have one for T1 and I'll have one for T2. Um, and in that go bottle, I will have in T1 about six to eight ounces of water. Um, I will have a serving of nutrition. I will have a serving of electrolytes. So uh, from the time that I stopped taking in my nutrition hydration before the race, uh, during the swim, all that, I didn't take in any hydration. I didn't take in any nutrition. It's going to be absolutely critical that we keep up with those as already mentioned. And I will continue to mention, uh, throughout our time here this evening. So, um, this go bottle is just a good opportunity to get a quick start as we're, uh, out there on the bike course to all three of those. So hydration, nutrition, electrolytes, getting in all of those just to get things started, get things primed as I, um, head out onto the bike. So that go bottle is right there in transition. I'm throwing on my helmet, my visor, 
grabbing my bike, but uh, just real quick, I'll grab that bottle. Um, and that uh, vitamin water bottle has that large mouth on it. So uh, to, to drink six to eight ounces of water, I can chug that real quick, um, toss the bottle there in the transition area and head out on to the bike course. So, uh, bike course is a one loop course. So as I mentioned before, a whole lot of turns, uh, out there. Um, so it's a good idea to go and see, uh, this drive it. So know exactly what you're in store for, uh, generally pretty good road quality. So I, I would say it's not the best, um, road quality, but it's certainly not the worst either. So, uh, it's going to be a pretty good ride, pretty smooth, uh, probably relatively comparable to, to what you're used to, to riding on. So hopefully you've got some pretty good, uh, roads that you're able to, to get out there, um, and train on. It is rolling with few flats. Um, so, uh, this is one of those, I, I think this is, it, it's a really fair, fun course. So, um, it's, it's definitely not flat. If you look down, um, at the elevation chart on the bottom, uh, you can see there's, there's really no long stretches of, of, of flats that said, um, for all the undulation that there is, it's not a particularly hilly course either. Um, there's nothing sustained over a 2% grade. Um, so everything is under 2%. There may be some very short segments that, that exceed 2%, um, but they're so short, they're, they're largely insignificant. So, um, it, with, with nothing sustained over 2% that again, really kind of qualifies as a, as a rolling course. It's, it's certainly not hilly. It's not flat. Um, but so I, I think this is where, um, these, these courses get, they get very interesting. They're very fun, especially with all the turns. You're not going to get bored. It's not like some of these courses where you're just going to be riding for 20, 30 miles in a straight line with, uh, no change in elevation. So, um, I, I think this, this, uh, course is going to pass by quite quickly. Um, and, and it's, um, actually quite, quite lovely. It's nice, uh, great views. Uh, so very enjoyable bike course. Um, it is exposed to, to sun and wind. Um, so, uh, take those into consideration as well. So a couple tips, uh, for the bike course, settle into the loop and build throughout. So this is kind of going back to, um, what I said in on the swim, where we want to break the course down into sections, um, and attack each one. Now this is going to help uh, process. But again, this, this bike course, again, I think it's going to go quite quickly. Um, but we want to do here is set ourselves up for a well-executed bike segment. So, uh, one of the ways we can do that is, is starting relatively easy, uh, and then building throughout. So, um, come out of the swim, settle down, let your heart rate settle. If it's, if it's elevated through the swim and through transition, take that first, uh, those first couple miles, pretty easy. Um, begin to, uh, start your, um, hydration, your nutrition and electrolytes. Uh, remember that go bottle is a great, uh, kickstart, uh, to that and then monitor your power and your heart rate. So, um, because of the way this course is set up, it's going to be more difficult to maintain a, a very constant steady, uh, power. So if this were a completely flat course with those long stretches that, that get real boring, it's pretty easy to maintain your, your target power, goal power for, for the race. But because of the undulations in this bike course, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So, um, obviously you want to monitor your power, but also keep an eye on your heart rate. So your heart rate is not going to vary as much as that power number. So it's going to be a good metric to monitor as well. So, uh, we're, we're keeping an eye both on power and heart rate, um, and, and using both of those metrics to execute our, uh, exertion here, stay ahead of hydration and nutrition. So, um, Basically what we're looking to do with, with everything that we do on, on race day, throughout the race, leading into the race, we want our set ourselves up for a strong run. So that starts on the bike. So oftentimes what we're not going to see is even if we get behind on hydration, nutrition, electrolytes on the bike, it's really not going to manifest until the run. You may finish the bike, bike feeling, uh, well hydrated, feeling strong, um, even if you are behind. Um, so what we want to do is set ourselves up for a good, strong run. Part of that is ensuring we come off the bike again with good levels of hydration. We're up on our nutrition, our electrolytes are topped off and there for us 
when we need them out on the run course. So be, be cognizant of that. Stay up on those, making sure that you have a well-tested plan and execute it out there. Also, absolutely critical to stay cool. It's a little bit easier to stay cool on the bike. You've got that ambient cooling because you're moving at a much faster pace uh, than you will be on the run. But again, um, your body is going to limit your performance if your core temperature begins to exceed what is safe. So um, one of the things here we've already mentioned is the um, we're still having some quite warm temperatures. Uh, chances are race day will get into the upper 80s, even lower 90s. Um, and, and even if that is when you're out there on the run, again, we're setting ourselves up for a strong run. Um, there is a, uh, cumulative effect to your core temperature. So remember it, uh, you started generating body heat, um, out there on the swim course, you've continued to generate body heat, um, on the bike course, and you will, uh, continue to do that out there on the run. And, and those are even exponentially more so. So you'll, you'll generate body heat on the swim. You'll generate more body heat on the bike and you'll generate the most body heat while out there running. So again, what we want to ensure is that we are doing what we can to, to control and minimize our core temperature, um, out there on the bike. So my recommendation here is every time you go through an aid station, grab a cold water bottle. Uh, the first thing I will do with that cold water bottle is I will spray my face, um, which gives you a good sensation of being cool. Um, and then I will take a, a big chug, uh, of, of that cold water. Um, so what I've done now is, is worked on controlling my, my body temperature from the outside as well as the inside. Um, next I'll, I'll spray, uh, as much as my body as I can get my kit wet with that cold water. Uh, I will then take another chug of that cold water. And then usually, um, I will dump that bottle out, uh, ditch it, um, there in those trash zones that are located at each of the aid stations. So as you roll into those aid stations, the first thing you're going to encounter is water, then Gatorade, then your foods, and then the opposite. You'll have Gatorade and then water. So if you miss water um, at that first opportunity, there will be another opportunity there as you are exiting that transition area. The only difference is you'll have less time in that trash zone. So make sure that you're not uh, dumping anything out outside of those um safe zones. Um, I always recommend taking a cold water bottle. So even if you have one that you have been riding with for say the last 15 miles, that water is no longer cold. If you're using the on course Gatorade, um, regardless of how much you have in that bottle, go ahead and dump it, take a fresh one. Um, that cold water or cold Gatorade is going to be more palatable. So you're more likely to, to drink more of it. So that's going to help you again, stay cool and stay up on your nutrition and electrolytes. As you begin to approach uh, the end of the bike course, begin to prep for T2 and the run. So uh, a couple things we can do here. First, my rule of thumb is to not take anything in in the last 20 minutes of the bike. So uh, 20 minutes for me is, is around six to seven miles. So when I'm give or take mile 50, I will make sure uh, say miles 47 to 50 that I am up and, and good on hydration, nutrition, and electrolytes. And then I'm going to pause everything I've been talking about so far this evening. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm not going to take in any more fluids or any foods, anything like that. What I don't want is to start the run with a stomach full of, of food and fluids sloshing around and have that bloated feeling or have water sloshing around in my stomach as I start the run. So those last 20 minutes of the bike, I'm going to allow my stomach to empty um, so that I can start off um, the, the run uh, with a, with a happy stomach. So nothing in those last 20 minutes, if I'm feeling thirsty, what I may do is just get a rinse out. Um, so, so just, uh, get it in my mouth, swish it around a little bit, spit it out, or maybe just, uh, drink just a, a little bit. But again, the, the objective here is to allow my stomach to empty so that I can start off strong on, on the run. The other thing I'm going to do is match my bike cadence to my run cadence. So, um, when I'm racing a 70.3, I generally have a bike cadence around 90, uh, excuse me, 80 to 85 RPM. Uh, my run cadence is a little bit faster in that 85 to 90, uh, steps per minute per foot. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in those last few miles, I'm going to increase my cadence, um, so that I can develop a feel, uh, have that proprioception of what does that 90, uh, steps per minute feel like? 
Um, so this is developing neurological pathways between your brain and your feet. Um, so doing that uh, for the last couple of minutes, once you come out of transition, uh, your brain is going to know exactly what that feels like. And you will automatically, very quickly, very easily settle into your run cadence. And that's going to help with your run pace. All right, transition two tips uh, look exactly like the T1 tips. Uh, for good reason, they're pretty much the same. Be efficient, pack minimally, minimally practice in advance, and consider a go bottle. So uh, the one thing that's different here on this T2 go bottle is instead of the six to eight ounces of fluid uh, that I have in T1, I will do more of, of 10 to 12 ounces. So um, I haven't had anything over the last 20 minutes. My stomach has had the opportunity to empty uh, very quickly. Um, generally, I can take in those 10 to 12 ounces and my stomach is, is good to go. So I can uh, take that down, get a jump start again on hydration, electrolytes, and nutrition uh, without causing any GI distress, bloating, uh, sloshing, anything like that. Now, if you have continued to drink throughout the entire bike leg, I would not recommend, uh, quickly downing those 10 to 12 ounces in transition. That's going to be too much. Um, so that is why, uh, I, I do that. So again, uh, just a little bit more 10 to 12 ounces, as opposed to the six eight ounces in T1. If my stomach is feeling a little, uh, sour, a little gurgly, if I'm not ready, uh, to, to take in that full 10 to 12 ounces of water, uh, it truly becomes that go bottle. I will take the bottle with me. Um, and then I will nurse it over however long necessary. Maybe it's the first quarter mile. Maybe it's the first mile, maybe it's the first two miles. Uh, and then I'll just ditch that bottle at an aid station and then, um, convert over to, to my normal run, uh, nutrition plan. All right, headed out on to the run course. So this very oddly shaped uh, run course is a two loop course. Uh, it is all around the parks there, which is quite nice, quite lovely. Uh, it is a combination of road and paved path. So it's not, uh, not dirt path crushed anything. It's, it's a paved path. So, uh, good road surfaces. Uh, there is a decent amount of shade out here. Um, I would say more than, than most. So, uh, that actually generally works um, in, in your favor. So, uh, a lot of courses you're out there, uh, exposed to, to a lot of sun for a lot of time, uh, much more shade out here on this course. So there again, decent amount of, of shade, uh, kind of like the, the bike course. This is a, um, not flat course, but it's not necessarily a hilly course, um, as, as, as well, even though I actually use that word here in just a second coming up, uh, I kind of like the bike. I would define it as, as a rolling course, uh, with the caveat that, um, there is a flatter section and a hillier section out there. So, uh, you will start there, uh, where it says start, uh, out of transition, uh, you will head out there to the East and to the South, uh, around the Lake initially. Um, that's what I would refer to as the Southern loop um, is, is relatively flat. If you look down there on the elevation charts at the bottom of the screen, that, that first section you'll see there is pretty flat. Whereas, um, basically then we run into a, a, a section where, uh, there's more of a climb and, and more undulation. So basically again, reminder, it is a two loop course. So those two sections of that elevation chart, um, are mirror images simply because it's the same thing twice. So as you are headed out of transition, you get, you get to, uh, kind of start on the flat. Then once you have settled in, uh, as you head into that more so Northern loop, that is where you're going to experience more undulation, more change in elevation. And then, uh, around the halfway mark, uh, you get to experience those flats again. And then as you approach the finish line, uh, on the second loop, that is where you're going to experience more of those hills. All right, couple tips for the run course. Break the course into sections. This is the same thing that uh, I've been talking about, swim, bike, run, the race in general. Uh, don't come out of transition thinking, man, I have to run 13.1 miles. Um, break it into sections. So you've got two loops, so there's opportunity there. You have uh, kind of two, two loop sections. Again, they have the southern loop and the northern loop. Um, so as you're headed out of transition, just think about this: uh, these first two miles relatively flat. And that's going to be my first uh, section. Once I'm hitting that 
two and a half mile mark or so, and I'm headed into that hillier section, that's my focus now is just to round out this northern loop. I'm going to run the uh, hillier section, uh, and then I'm going to do it all over again. So ease in and build throughout. Uh, don't overdo it on that uh, initial section. Um, hopefully, uh, you're feeling really good out of transition. Um, you've matched your cadence at the end of the bike, so you're going to have a good turnover. Um, your stomach is going to feel great because you hadn't taken anything in those last 20 minutes, and you just had a manageable amount in that go bottle. So feeling great coming out of there. But remember, you do have to run a half marathon, so don't overdo it. Don't run out too easy. Pretty common mistake we see people make is they're feeling really good out of transition. Um, and fortunately, that really good feeling out of transition oftentimes doesn't last for that full 13 miles. So be a little conservative and make sure you're not overdoing it. But uh, if you come into that second loop and you're still feeling great, now is when you can let it all hang out and run that second loop as fast as you want without having to hold back. For the last time, I'm going to remind you to stay hydrated. So um, this is absolutely critical. Again, this is what you've been setting up all day. Um, and it's not time to, to, to relax or back off that hydration. Um, maybe as you're heading in those last couple miles, you can, you can, uh, can, but especially in the first loop, first half of the second loop, ensure that you are staying hydrated. And that's also going to uh, go along with your nutrition, your electrolytes as well, making sure you're keeping up with all of those. Uh, also, it is absolutely critical to stay cool. This is where you are going to find out how well you've executed your race. Uh, race execution is about pace. It's about nutrition, hydration, and electrolytes um, and staying cool. If you have managed those variables, you're going to feel fantastic out here on this run course. You're going to run the second loop even faster than you did the first, and you're going to pass a whole bunch of people uh, who did not uh, execute their race as well as you did. So um, especially on a day like it's looking like it's going to be, again, highs somewhere in the upper 80s, low 90s, chances are it's going to be humid as well. It is going to be absolutely critical that you maintain that core temperature. So uh, recommendation is to take something from every aid station. Now, uh, you paid a whole bunch of money to be part of this race. So part of this is just getting your money's worth. Um, but perhaps more importantly is uh, these aid stations are going to be spaced approximately every mile and uh, you're going to need something uh, on those intervals. So uh, whether it be your nutrition, your hydration, your electrolytes, um, taking those in on a regular interval to ensure that uh, you're staying up on those. Um, again, stick to your plan, know what your plan is, stick with it as uh, and, until it's not working and then adjust. Um, but even if it's not uh, taking in something, uh, your cooling protocol is going to involve these aid stations as well. So uh, it's uh, the ice, the water, pour the pour the cold water over your skin, over your arms, over your head, uh, pour the ice, um, down your shorts, down your jersey, under your hat, whatever, you, wherever you can stash that ice to help, again, cool your body from the outside, as well as cool your body from the inside. So um, kind of my long course protocol is that first aid station, I'm going to take a gel and uh, rinse it down with some cold water. Uh, the second aid station, I'm going to focus on cooling protocols. So pouring cold water over my body, ice down uh, my shorts, down my jersey, and then uh, going to continue that. So every odd aid station is a gel and water um, and, and uh, cooling the outside as, as needed. And then really focusing on uh, maintaining core temperature on those evenly numbered aid stations. All right, from here, we are headed to the finish line. So again, my ambition, my hope is that I have provided you with some good advice, some good tips to where you are coming into this finish line, feeling absolutely fantastic, setting a massive PR and creating amazing memories of an amazing day. So uh, just a couple reminders as you head into that finish line, clean it up, all the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into this day don't need to end up in your finisher picture. And then be sure to take it all in. This is what you've been working for, dreaming about, 
Uh, the finish is what you're going to uh, remember. This is what's going to bring you back again and again. The finish line at these long course races is uniquely special. So make sure that you take it in. Once you enter into that finishing shoot, once you step onto that red carpet, make sure that you are present, you are paying attention, listen for your name to be called and really enjoy it. Take it all in. Plan your finish. Uh, what, what is it that you want to do there at the finish line? Um, you've got some, I, I would say, unique, uh, cool opportunities uh, in, in this race, especially uh, especially with the uh, partnership with St. Jude. Um, so plan your finish, enjoy it, celebrate. Find some space. Um, so triathlon is an individual sport. Um, you've been out there uh, largely, uh, moving under your own power all day long. So, uh, if you're kind of in a crowd, uh, maybe just hang back a little bit, let them go, let them have their time there at the finish line, find some space where you can enjoy your finish line as well. Now, if you made a, a friend out there on the run and you guys have ran the last 10 miles together, by all means, uh, celebrate that, uh, accomplishment together. And then for me, it's all the high fives. I love running down a Ironman finishing shoot. Uh, they've got kids, your support crew, total strangers willing to, uh, give you a high five, knowing full well that your hand is an absolute biohazard, uh, by now. So again, really enjoy it, celebrate it, um, and take it all in. All right. That is what I've got. Uh, again, I hope this time has been beneficial for you. I hope, uh, all of this has helped to increase your confidence and reduce your stress. Uh, I hope I've answered uh, your questions. I do have a few here. We've got uh, a few minutes here also to, to get in some questions. So again, um, I'm going to get in as many questions as I can here in about the next uh, give or take 10 minutes. Um, if I don't get to your question, I will follow up with you uh, in the next couple of days via email. Uh, if you have not yet submitted your question or if something pops up in the next couple of days, or if six months from now you're watching this uh, on YouTube, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is john at tribetriathlon.net. Okay, first question. Uh, hopefully this is this is one that uh, is, is not uh, of use, but inevitably if you race long enough, uh, it will. Uh, what are your tips for racing in the rain? So uh, even as we can see here from this picture, those roads uh, were wet from the deluge that uh that uh, plagued the race uh previously so again hopefully um that is not the case for this year hopefully uh the rain stays away and this is kind of a moot point but again uh at some point if you race long enough you'll inevitably race in the rain so um there are actually pros and cons to racing in the rain uh not a whole lot to do uh for for the swim obviously you're going to be wet you're going to be a little bit wetter if that's possible uh, from, from swimming in the rain, um, transition, uh, the biggest thing there. And, and, and like I already mentioned here, uh, this, this transition area can get quite muddy, uh, especially if it's wet in the days leading into the race and everyone's been, been trotting through there, dropping their bikes off and, and doing all that, setting up transition in the morning. Uh, the more footsteps it has, the muddier it's going to be. So it kind of depends on when the rain, uh, has, has started, how long it's rained, how hard it's rained, all of that. Um, so, uh, maybe it's modifying your transition a little bit, um, having your, your shoes in say a, uh, plastic bag or something like that to try to keep them dry. Um, uh, maybe it's, uh, waiting till you get out of the muddy area onto the path to put your shoes on. I've done that in races before where I've had a very muddy, um, transition. So, uh, adjust your transition as, as needed. Uh, we talked about tire pressure previously. Um, the, the thought here is just a little bit less tire pressure. Um, again, that's going to put a little bit more rubber on the road, provide a little bit more, uh, traction, um, so far as that goes. So, uh, maybe it's taking five to 10, uh, pounds of pressure out of your tires. Um, and then being hyper vigilant for, uh, anything that can be slick. So, uh, most common things we encounter, um, that, that can turn slick are, uh, like painted stripes. So the stripes on the road, those, those can get slick when wet reflectors, um, manhole covers, things like that, anything metal, uh, that you may be riding over. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and, and also we want to take care of one another out there. So if you see something like that, be sure to point that out to, to your fellow cyclist. 
Um, not a whole lot out on the run. Usually uh, it's it's kind of a benefit uh, to, to have rain on the run. Um, things like blisters on your shoes. So uh, maybe it's some Vaseline or something like that to um, keep your feet from, from getting those bl- blisters. But uh, usually um, we all just turn into big kids and, and really enjoy running uh, in the rain. It's a little bit cooler, uh, which can really help mitigate all those things we talked about. You have to worry far less about managing core temperature when it's uh, in the rain. It's kind of hard uh, to overheat when you're uh, when you're running in the rain. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what if I get a flat? Um, now, this is something um, that if it does rain, hopefully it doesn't, uh, but there is a an increase in flats on, on wet roads. Uh, basically, the rain kind of moves around debris on the roads and, and stirs up stuff that has settled into cracks, all that. So um, there can be an increase in, in flats on, on wet roads. So if it is raining, this, this can be even more of an issue, but obviously uh, dry roads are, are uh, conducive to flats as well. So um, there is neutral support out out there. There will be um, mechanics out there that can help with flats, but uh, keep in mind, this is a one loop course. So those guys are going to be covering 56 miles of, of road. Um, so my suggestion is to be self-sufficient. Um, go to your local bike shop, uh, watch some YouTube videos, practice at home, uh, be efficient in changing your own flat tire. So carry a flat kit with you. And uh, try to get it down to give or take five minutes of being able to, to change your flats so that uh, you're not spending a considerable amount of time either changing your own or waiting on um, that neutral support to, to reach you. Now, should you uh, find yourself on the side of the road with a flat, uh, I would say flag down any vehicle that you can. Um, even like the officials and those guys, they're not going to stop and help you. But uh, they're they're having they're going to have a radio, so they can radio in and say, "Hey, we've got an athlete at mile 22 that uh, needs support for for a flat," so they can help get that neutral support to you quicker. So flag them down. Start even if you're not completely um, efficient in in changing the flat. Do what you can. Get the get the wheel off. Get the tire off if you can. Uh, Have everything ready so that when uh, help does arrive, uh, you can get back on the road as quickly as possible. Uh, should I bring my own nutrition or take the nutrition that is offered on course? Um, basically the answer is whatever you've been doing, keep doing it. If you have been training with the Gatorade Endurance, then it is a great benefit to have that on course. One, uh, you don't have to bring it along. You don't have to worry about mixing it up on race morning, carrying it with you. Uh, and a huge benefit, as I've already mentioned, is the fact that they are going to hand you a cold bottle of that Gatorade Endurance. Now, um, I'm not a huge fan of the Gatorade Endurance. Uh, For me, the the flavor profile is way too strong. It leads to uh, palate fatigue, which makes it hard for me to drink. So I use different products. So I I bring them along. Great thing about racing is 70.3 is I have uh, adequate storage to uh, bring nutrition, uh, all the nutrition that I need out there on the bike with me without uh, having an excessive amount of, of weight and aerodynamic drag with uh, having a whole uh, buffet out there with me. So whatever it is that you've been been practicing with, continue that. So if you've been uh, using Gatorade and Endurance, absolutely. Uh, take it out there, take advantage of it. Uh, if you've been using something else, stick with that um, on race day. And again, uh, as I mentioned, I, I shift over uh, to where I, I bring my own nutrition on the bike, but then I use the on-course uh, gels, hydration, all of that out there on the run course. So again, hopefully you've, uh, got a well-vetted plan, whatever has been working for you in training will serve you well on race day. So, uh, continue, continue with that. Um, running out of time here, just a couple minutes to go. Um, and and I want to just make one closing comment here. Uh, and, and this is perhaps one of my favorite tips is to race with gratitude. Um, I mentioned before that triathlon is an individual sport. You've been out there all day operating under your own power, but the vast majority of us have uh, people who have supported us, who have allowed us and empowered us to to do this amazing thing, to create these memories, to uh, achieve these goals. So I, I always recommend in the days leading into the race, even now, uh, reach out to those that have supported you, who have enabled you to do this and 
express your gratitude to them for everything that they've done. Maybe the slack that a partner has picked up while you've been out training. Uh, maybe it's a coworker or friend training partner that encouraged you or even challenged you to take on this race. Um, and, and then once race day arrives, make sure uh, to express gratitude to the volunteers that are there, uh, not getting paid, but uh, we, we couldn't have these races without them. Perhaps you've been a volunteer in the past, so you know all that goes into it. It's a long, difficult uh, day for them as, as well. Um, thank the, the law enforcement that is out there at those uh, intersections and uh, controlling traffic, keeping things safe. Um, and then again, as, as I mentioned before, something unique around uh, the 70.3 Memphis race is the partnership with St. Jude. Um, there are going to be uh, reminders out there of those that uh, are, are not as, as fortunate as we are, those that are uh, battling uh, afflictions. So uh, be grateful for your health, be grateful uh, for the ability to go out and to do this and be sure to, to pass that along uh, to, to everyone uh, out there on the course. So with that, uh, we are up against our time. Uh, again, I want to say thank you for, for taking this time. I, I hope genuinely, sincerely, this has been beneficial. I hope that this, again, will help reduce your stress and increase your confidence so you can have an amazing experience out there at 70.3 Memphis. All the best. Have a great race. Good night.